and uh, we'll pick up where we left off. We've uh, the story so far, quick summary for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't. Uh, we started off with we, we are on the topic of trying to uh, to to uh, to talk about models that can analyze series inputs, where you have to look at a series of input data to make some decisions about and and compute the output. Iterated uh, structures like these, where uh, you consider a current input and a finite number of past inputs in order to compute a current output are good for analyzing time series data, series data which have short term, short term dependence on the past. So if uh, making a prediction, for instance, about uh, something that happens today only requires you to look at the, at the past four days of uh, input, then uh, uh, you'd, you'd use an iterated structure like these. These are these, uh, these are, uh, what we've uh, recognized as time delay neural networks or convolutional neural networks in uh, an earlier uh, part of the course. But if you want to analyze time series data with long-term dependencies, where the dependencies can, uh, can uh, carry over for an arbitrary amount of time in the past or into the future, then you need recurrent structures. Structures which are self-referential, which, uh, uh, which consider their own past hidden states or outputs in order to compute the current, uh, the output of the current time. So this we have seen. We saw this example of uh, something that could be done by a recurrent network and uh, realized that recurrent, uh, so uh, uh, when we have a neural network with such recurrence, we're gonna call it a recurrent neural network and we saw that recurrent neural networks can be incredibly effective at model mo modeling long-term dependencies. So for instance, if you analyze, if, you're, if you wanted to develop a neural network to analyze or even generate this program, then it would have to keep track about uh, parentheses that were closed, open, brackets that were open, loops that were open, variables, and when variables began their existence and when they became irrelevant and so on. And this would have to be, this information would have to be held on for an arbitrary amount of time. And we saw that recurrent networks are actually pretty good at, or at least can uh, potentially be good at, at capturing and retaining such, such information. We also saw that it wasn't just recurrent, uh, but it wasn't just problems that required, that uh, worked on time series data where recurrent neural networks were, uh, uh, could be useful. So even, in other problems like these, where, for instance, you were trying to develop a network to learn to add two binary numbers. The recurrent structure could be much smaller than something that would be a flat structure. So if you were, if you were for instance, trying to uh, uh, train a network that took in two 10-digit, 10 10-bit 10 numbers to output an 11-bit number, then A, the network would have to be very large to be able to capture all of the input patterns, pa patterns, combinations of input patterns that were required to uh, fully characterize the output. So here, you would have to consider all possible two raised to twenty, or two raised to twenty combinations of input, you know, and uh, to be able to f to accurately uh, compute, learn to compute ev the output for every single one of these uh, combinations. If you model the same thing using a, a, a recurrent network, the network would require just a few gates and had it had the added benefit that whereas the first network was restricted in that once you trained a network to add two n bit numbers, it wouldn't be useful for if, you had, if the inputs were n bit n plus one bits long, the recurrent network could actually deal with arbitrarily sized inputs. It wasn't just the structure, it was even the amount of training data required. So even if you had the optimal structure for the problem to the left, if you wanted to train it properly, then the network would have to see all, if, or at least a very large fraction of all two raised to 20 possible combinations of input in order, to, in order, to, in order for you to be sure that it actually learned to, uh, to give you the correct output, output for every single combination. Whereas the model on the right requires 
very little orders of magnitude, smaller amounts of data to learn to capture the same computation. So uh, by incorporating recurrence, we not only uh, were able to handle series data, these models can also be effective for other kinds of problems where you didn't originally as imagine that recurrence was a, was, uh, uh, was a part of the problem. Now this particular problem, uh, we uh, keep this uh, in, in uh, memory for a bit because we'll return to this example briefly in a different context. Now we also saw how recurrent structures could be trained. We would do so by minimizing the divergence between the sequence of outputs that the net network produced and the sequence of target outputs. And we would use gradient descent and backpropagation to train it. The real issue was in uh, defining the divergence. The divergence that we defined was no longer just a function of, uh, not no longer just a sum of the divergences for the individual outputs. It was actually a divergence between a series of inputs, a, a sequence of uh, outputs, and a sequence of desired outputs. Now, to see the difference between the two, I'm going to take you back just a few seconds to a, an example we saw a few instants ago, a few seconds ago, which is the addition problem. Now, if you think of the addition problem, if I had a recurrent network uh, to model this problem, and if I were training a recurrent network to model the problem, uh, to, to learn to add one bit numbers. Now think about this, if your inputs came in most significant bit first and uh, least significant bit last. Or it could, be, it could be other way, it doesn't really matter, right? So let's assume they came in least significant bit first and most significant bit last. Now an error in the first bit, the least significant bit, doesn't really change your output very much. An error in the fifth bit really results in a factor of 32 in the actual uh, error in the two, between the two numbers represented. So the manner in which you would compute your error actually depends on uh, the position where the error occurred. So it's no longer just the sum of, you know, you're not saying there are five bits of error. The fact that there are five bits of error matters a whole lot less if the five bits are the five least significant bits versus bit, bit numbers uh, ten, 6 through 10, right? So, but even so, it's not even as simple as just saying, and I'm going to scale these things up. It's worse because the error in the uh, sixth position may actually be a result of a, of a bogus carryover from an error in the fifth position or the fourth position. So you cannot even look at the local error to decide uh, what the effect of the, uh, uh, where the network has actually made the error. The actual error may, may have been made somewhere else, and if you're going to learn your network and adjust your network parameters, you must be adjusting it to fix the error there and not something that happened here. So you see that it's, uh, although it's just comparing two sequences of numbers or two sequences of bits, the actual manner in which the, in, in which the divergence is computed can be arbitrarily complicated and it's not just a question of simply adding divergences at individual instance, right? So this kind of complicates this issue a whole lot. And in fact, this is what we're going to be spending our time on today, uh, dealing with divergences uh, of uh, various kinds. Now we won't explicitly look at the kind of divergence that we saw in the addition problem, but we'll look at other problems. We also saw some characteristics of these recurrent networks. We saw that when they're in the process of inf performing inference, computing the outputs for a given, in given input, they could be unstable. Uh, so uh, you had different uh, behaviors that you could see. If the uh, hidden, uh, the uh, activations of the hidden layers, which actually are the activations of the recurrent layers, which carried information into the future, were, sig were linear, the network had a tendency to just blow up or simply vanish to zero. Uh, the, if uh, you had something like a sigmoid activation, then regardless of what the input was, the uh, network would quickly saturate and give you a fixed output. If you had something like a tan H, then it retained some information about what had happened at any time for a little longer, but then eventually it had the same behavior. The output became independent of what the input was and just went to some fixed value. 
If you had something like a ReLU activation, then once again, a ReLU is just a linear activation of different of a different kind. The output could either blow up or vanish to zero. So the inference perform, when these networks are performed by these networks can be unstable going forward. So also, trying to learn these networks can be uh, frustrating because uh, uh, we would, uh, the way we would train these networks is, is through backpropagation, where we would compute, perform backpropagation through time. You'd compute the error at any time, and then you'd propagate that derivative of that error backwards all the way to the very beginning of the sequence. And we saw that uh, this effectively just makes it one very deep network and that in deep networks, the derivatives tend to either vanish or blow up as you go backwards through the network. And so we saw this particular example of, uh, uh, of a multi-layer perceptron, in this case, not a recurrent network, but a very deep network with 19 layers. Not even very deep, just a relatively deep network with 19 layers, where uh, the derivatives at the uh, output layer, which are shown at the bottom of the network, basically uh, disappear and become uniform and, and zero by the time you get to the, get closer to the input, which is, a, which is at the top of the figure. And this happened regardless of the kind of activation you used. So uh, the gist of this is that while recurrent networks are theoretically able to retain information for long periods of time and, and are effective for, for analyzing series data, in reality, they tend to have bad behavior both during inference and when you're trying to train these networks. And these are particularly problematic because our primary requirement for, uh, for when we uh, began speaking of such networks was that we wanted to retain long-term dependencies. And long-term dependencies occur everywhere. And the addition problem that you saw, for instance, if I were just looking at the sum of two one-bit numbers, uh, two, I mean, two binary, sequ binary uh, sequences, then something that happened happens at, uh, at the second position, position can result in a carryover that just uh, that sort of scrolls through the entire input for an arbitrary number of bits. So assigning, a, uh, uh, assigning uh, the uh, responsibility for some, for, for some output to the network to what happened in the input can be very unclear because something that happens now could have been triggered by something, something that, ha that came in a very long time ago. Uh, you see such behaviors uh, more obviously in things like language. So here, for instance, we have the sentence, Jane had a quick lunch in the bistro, then she. The fact that the word is she and not he was dependent on Jane, and any number of words could have happened in between. So it's really not a very clear, distinct uh, distinct characterization of how long you must wait before you can afford to forget something. And uh, the, the, the uh, standard recurrent network didn't actually have this kind of memory behavior. So uh, we introduced the long short term memory network, which addressed this problem in part by having input dependent memory behavior. So uh, uh, the uh, LSTM, basically what the LSTM actually does is it addresses the problem of latching the input going forward, latching the memory going forward, in that the memories are not dependent on the ability to retain memory it becomes independent of the, or somewhat independent of the parameters of the network, and more directly dependent on what what the current inputs are. And the inputs and uh, the memories can be uh, uh, incremented or decremented based on inputs. So uh, uh, it actually is able to latch on to memories and modify them based on input rather than merely on the parameters of the network. The uh, LSTM based architectures look just like your regular recurrent neural network architectures, except that those little green boxes which represented the hidden states in your recurrent neural network, are now each individually an LSTM cell. And once we uh, have this, make this modification, and abstract these things out to being LSTM cells, then they, are, they are just look like any other recurrent architecture. 
even in terms of implementation, if you went through the, the slides of, from, from last class, it didn't make a tremendous difference to your code. We saw this, right? So uh, uh, these networks, again, can be used in recurrent architectures just as your standard recurrent neural network. You can have a left to right analysis of this kind or even bidirectional versions where any input is analyzed going both forward and backward before deciding what the output must be at each time. And as before, when we want to train these networks, the, uh, the uh, manner in which we do so is exactly the same, same. We try to minimize the divergence between the output of the network, the sequence of outputs of the network, and the sequence of target outputs. And once again, uh, defining this divergence can be challenging. And since these divergences are really divergences between sequences, uh, trying to assign responsibility, which particular output affected the divergence more or less, uh, it depends on, is uh, going to be key. And uh, this uh, assignment is not independent for every single output, as we saw, because one output, the, the influence of one output on the divergence can also affect the influence of a different output on the divergence. So today and in the next couple of classes, we are going to be dealing primarily with how to uh, deal with networks when the divergence itself is obscurely uh, defined. So what follows in the series on recurrent networks is this. We're going to talk about architectures and how to train networks of different architectures, but uh, we are going to be considering uh, now uh, the examples we've seen, the figures we've seen, showed a specific kind of input-output relation, where any time an input came in, the network produced an output. So the inputs and outputs were synchronized. But as it turns out, once you begin to think of these networks more generically, then such synchrony is not required. So you can have different kinds of synchronies. You can have a, a, a model where uh, the target output is time synchronous with the input, meaning any time an input comes in, the network produces an output. Or the target output is order synchronous. In response to a sequence of inputs, the, the network produces a sequence of outputs. The order in which the outputs occur depends on the order in which the inputs occur, but the number of outputs may be different from the number of inputs. So, uh, or you can have other, kind, other such kinds of relations. So let's take a look at, uh, and we'll see how both how to make predictions or inference with these networks and how to train them. So here are standard variants of recurrent networks. These images from Andre, are from Andre Karpathy's page, but they illustrate the idea very nicely. The figure to the left shows no recurrence. The, every time you have an input, the network processes it, it produces an output. So this is just a conventional multi-layer perceptron. Now the figure to the right is a, is a recurrent network. A sequence of inputs comes in, and the network produces a sequence of outputs. And there is one output for every input that came in. So now this is a time synchronous, uh, uh, no, these network outputs are time synchronous. The, uh, as soon as an input comes in, the network processes it along with any information it has carried over from the past and uses, uses the combined information to produce the output immediately. So it's time synchronous. But then you can have something of this kind, where the network analyzes an entire sequence of inputs and then produces a single output. This, for example, would happen if you were performing speech recognition. You would sequence, see a sequence of inputs and say, ah, this was the phoneme ah. Or if you were performing something like question answering, you look at the sequence of words that came in, which would be a query, and then only when the query was fully understood would you produce the answer. So you're going to get a single answer when the entire input has been, uh, has been uh, processed. And then you can have order synchronous, uh, uh, well, order synchronous uh, computation, like the figure to the right. So this would happen, for instance, when, uh, you, were, when you were trying to recognize continuous speech. So as speech comes in, the speech the speech is going to be represented as a sequence of vectors, as we've seen in our homeworks. Every now and then, you're going to say, ah, we've just seen the phoneme ah. We've just seen the phoneme e. So the outputs come out in a specific order, which depends very much on the sequence in which the, in which the inputs came in. 
but the number of output symbols and where the outputs are generated are uh, not the same as the length of the input. Uh, they, they are not, the number of output symbols is not the same as the number of input, sim, input vectors. And the outputs can occur at different locations since there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the outputs and the inputs. Nevertheless, they're order synchronous. If you change the order of the input, then the outputs are going to change, right? So you can also have something of this kind where uh, the uh, network analyzes an entire series of inputs and then produces an entire series of outputs. So this would happen if you were translating text, for instance. You were translating from English to French. You have to see the entire sentence before you decide what, what the output must be. You cannot doing, uh, begin doing it uh, even before the sentence is complete because the grammar rules in these languages are different. The verb might happen at the very end in one language. It might occur in the beginning of the other. So if you began translating in the, you know, online, then most of the time your output is going to be wrong. So you'd have to actually wait to see the entire input before you produce the entire output. Or the last example, where you might have just a single input and then you produce an entire sequence of outputs. So if you were captioning an image, for instance, you'd see the image, you'd get some input, get, get some, make some inferences from it and then feed it to your network which produces the text that describes the image. But the, in the image itself is not a time series, it's just, an, it's just a single input, right? So you have all of these variants and they're all just different kinds of recurrences. There are input recurrences, there are output recurrences, there can be synchrony or lack of synchrony between the output, input and the output, right? So uh, let's uh, go through these a little bit, one at a time, and see how these uh, uh, look at the standard training and, uh, and inference paradigms. So this one here is just your conventional MLP. Now, if you are processing, again, remember, we are speaking of analyzing sequences of inputs. So if you were processing a sequence of inputs with a conventional MLP, then each input is going to be, pro in, going to be analyzed independently of every other input. So there's really no recurrence in the model. There's no information being carried forward. There are exactly as many outputs as inputs. So here you do get time synchrony. And every input produces a unique output, regardless of what any of the other inputs are. And again, you can define a divergence between the sequence of outputs produced by the network and the sequence of target outputs. In fact, this is really what you would be doing. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, only, if, uh, only issue being that uh, in, practi in practice, we sort of try to think of it as, uh, as uh, the sum of divergences at individual times. But there's nothing, the more general concept is that you're really trying to compute the divergence between the sequence of inputs, uh, sequence of outputs and the sequence of target outputs. When you train these networks, you compute a gradient which is back propagated at each time. So uh, you would compute the divergence between the uh, sequence of inputs and the sequence of outputs. You compute the derivative of that divergence with respect to each output and then move that downwards. Now the common assumption we make over here in these models is that the divergence between these two sequences just can be decomposed into the sum of the divergences at the individual times. Or you can think of it more generically as a weighted sum of the divergences at the individual times, which means that if you want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to a specific input, then that can be computed independently of, the, of what, what happens at other times. The, uh, and most commonly, when you think of this as a weighted uh, sum of divergences, the weights that you assume are unity, right? So the typical divergence that we've seen in these cases are the uh, uh, cross entropy divergence between uh, the actual output and the target output, right? This is, this, this is what we have seen. Now let's consider this other one, the next more, more complex model, which is the, uh, where you have the conventional time synchronous MLP. Now this you would use, for instance, if you were, uh, if you were doing something like part of speech tagging. So here, for, for instance, uh, 
So while I'm at this, I'll actually briefly detour into language modeling because you're going to see a lot more of that uh, later in the course. So here, for instance, if you got a sequence of far words, like the words two roads diverged in a yellow wood, then the, 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 uh, the objective is to assign a part of speech tag to every single word in this sequence with a one-to-one -one correspondence. So uh, you would want to be able to analyze the sequence of words and say that the word two is counting, the word roads is, is a plural noun, diverged is a word, is a verb, uh, A is a determiner, yellow is an adjective, wood is a noun. You know. So you want to be able to assign tags to every one of these words. Now, when you actually perform inference in this, in the, in this context, the inference just progresses left to right. You're going to be uh, analyzing the inputs as they come in, and you could produce the outputs. Now, this is not really required. In fact, uh, in, in this particular problem, just doing a strictly left to right inference probably is not the best thing to do. So here, the more appropriate thing would be for, for you to analyze the input left to right, analyze the input right to left again, compute hidden states at each time. When I say time, I'm really speaking of a positional index in the input series, and combine these hidden outputs to uh, produce the final output. Now, in the rest of the lecture, so more, the generic situation case is that would be for you to be thinking of bidirectional recurrences, because these tend to be more effective than unidirectional recur recurrences where, they, where the logistics of the problem will permit it. But in the rest of the lecture, both today and in the next class, I'm going to be using uh, unidirectional, uh, unidirectional uh, uh, inference as my, my, my basic uh, platform for explanation. But then in your minds, you must generalize this to the bidirectional uh, versions. So how do you actually train these networks? We use backpropagation through time. You're given a collection of uh, sequence training instances comprising input sequences and output sequences of equal length with one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So uh, because these are time synchronous, then uh, you have a sequence of inputs x. And for each input, you have a target output d. And uh, the, uh, when you actually perform inference with this input in a forward pass, you're going to get, you'd pass the entire data through the network. You generate an output at each time. And then during the train, a backward pass, which is what you use to compute gradients for your gradient updates, you compute gradients between, uh, uh, between the divergence, between the actual, uh, the, the, the gradient of the derivative of the divergence between the actual output of the networks and the desired output at each time and pass these derivatives backward. So uh, again, the divergence computed is between the sequence of outputs and the desired sequence of the, and the desired sequence of outputs. So this is not just the sum of the divergences at individual times, unless you explicitly define it that way, right? So, uh, and backpropagation, of course, is very straightforward. We've seen this before. You would start off by initially computing the derivative of the divergence with respect to the final output, y of t. And then you could use the chain rule to uh, take a step back and compute the derivative with respect to the affine combination of inputs at the final time. And then move that down one step down, compute the derivatives with respect to the weights, and just keep moving backwards. So uh, this we've seen in some painful detail in the last class. So uh, this really, uh, we, we will not spend much time on this. The key component here is the computation of this derivative, which is the derivative of the divergence with respect to any single output. Now, the, the fact here is that this divergence is a vector function in the sense that it takes a sequence of inputs and produces a sequence of outputs. And, and, and uh, it takes in a, a sequence of actual outputs, a sequence of target outputs, so it takes in two sequences and computes a number, right? So uh, this is, uh, so changing any one of these guys, any input could, ch could result, change the 
uh, derivative at any other time. And this, so uh, that actually complicates matters a whole lot, we'll see. Now, once again, the most common assumption we make in these scenarios is that the divergence is actually the sum of the divergences at individual times. And if you make the simplifying assumption, then the computation of the derivative of the divergence with respect to the, uh, to the outputs at individual times becomes simple because you just have to uh, compute each of these derivatives individually and don't have to consider the other outputs, right? So, uh, and once again, the typical divergence for these, these kinds of scenarios, if you are performing classification, is the cross entropy divergence. Now, uh, consider the simple case. So, I'm going to segue a little bit into a slightly, uh, well, not quite on tangent, but a related, but uh, a related problem, which is that of analyzing text. Now, consider the problem, one specific case where we need such time synchronous. Uh, models, right? You, you want to analyze a sequence of text and predict the next word. So uh, you are given a sequence of words w0 through wk, and you must predict what is the next word, wk plus 1. Now, the simple way of doing this, simple way of thinking about it is something like this. So, or you could do the same thing with a sequence of characters. Look at a sequence of characters and predict the next character. So the way you would do it, you would represent the input as one-hot vectors, or rather embeddings of one-hot vectors. We will see what embeddings are shortly. And the output is going to be a probability distribution over the symbols that you can produce. So if you are trying to look at a sequence of characters and predict the next character, then the input is going to be a sequence of one-hot vectors of, of, uh, uh, for characters. And the output, if you're, you have to pre-specify a character set, of course. So if you have some n characters in your character in, in your symbol set, the output is going to be a probability distribution over n symbols. And uh, you would be sell you would select one of these to, to uh, ideally the most uh, likely character to decide what the what the what the best guess for the next character is. So when you train something of this kind you would typically have a long sequence of inputs coming in. And uh, now, again, you don't have separate input and output sequences, right? So uh, uh, I would give you text. And when I see the text, I already know at each position what the next word must be, simply because this is the next word in the text. I give you a, a text which, uh, which says, uh, uh, a four score and uh, whatever years ago. So when I say four score, I know the next word is and. So for, if I say four score and, then I know the next word is seven and so on. So you can actually, the, the target output is already embedded in the input. So you'd have the sequence of words, w0, w1, w2, w3, and so on. And the sequence of output target words at each time is simply the next word in the sequence. Now, uh, the uh, input symbols may be one hot vectors. The output is going to be a probability distribution over the symbols, which is the next, uh, which in this case is going to be the next word. And this will figure into in the next lecture. So typically in these situations, we are going to assume that the divergence, particularly when I'm modeling language, I would assume that the divergence is simply going to be the sum of the divergences at individual times where at each time, the, di the local divergence at each time is once again just a cross entropy. Now, the uh, target output would be represented as a one hot vector. There's the actual output. So the actual output is going to give you a probability distribution of all of the words. So if you have words w0 through, say, wn, then the actual output is going to give you probabilities for each of these words. And the target output is going to be something like 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is 1 hot. And when you compute the cross entropy between these two, now observe that this 1 simply identifies which of these words should really have been output. 
and the cross entropy, which is simply summation i di log y i over di minus. This is going to be 0 for most of these guys. So you can just focus on this one. For that one, di is 1. So this is simply going to be minus log y, whatever, the, uh, the output assigned to the correct word at that time, the probability, log of the probability assigned to the correct word at that time, right? So this uh, will figure, so keep this in mind. Now, again, just continuing my detour a little bit. If, when I'm modeling language using time, using time synchronous, uh, synchronous, uh, synchronous net, networks, uh, we get some interesting, uh, interesting kinds of behaviors. So uh, remember this example that we began with, right? I started off asking you what this open source project was. And I showed you some code. This code had been generated by a recurrent neural network, right? So how exactly did this happen? Now this is based on the simple principle of, of prediction of time series. Now, so let's abstract this back to the, this, uh, pro this problem of predicting the next symbol in a sequence, which could be words or characters. So in the ca case of words, you'd be given something like four score and seven, year, seven years, and asked, what is the next word? The next word here, obviously. Your general knowledge is going to say this is from the Gettysburg Address, uh, uh, that uh, this is four score and seven years ago, right? Or if I told you A, B, A, the, the words, characters until now are A, B, R, A, H, A, M, L, I, N, C, O, L, and I asked you what the next character was, then you would almost certainly guess that the next character is M. So where did that information come from? How did you know that the, that the next one was uh, a go in one case or N in the next? And how would you actually train a network to capture, these, uh, capture this information? So once again, here you would represent your words as one hot vectors. You have to pre-specify a, a vocabulary of n words in a fixed order. And every word is going to be represented as a, sequence, as a vector of zeros with a one in the position that is specific to that particular word. And if you are trying to do the character prediction problem, then you can do the same thing with characters, right? One hot representation of characters. And for English in particular, you need only about 100 characters uh, to include both upper and lower cases, spaces, all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of punctuation like commas, hyphens, apostrophes, the whole lot. So now, if I give you n, 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 my, n words, n minus 1 words, and ask you to predict the nth word, or n minus 1 characters, and ask you to predict the nth character, then the real problem you're addressing is the one to the top, to the top left. You are given w1 through wn minus 1, and you must compute a function of these guys which actually predicts wn. So one way to think about it is, since we are representing all, representing all of these words as one-hot one hot vectors, that you have this collection of one-hot vectors, all of which go into some function. And the function operates on this collection of one-hot vectors, and it produces the next word also as a one hot vector, ideally, right? Now, there's a small dimensionality problem over here. And in our case, of course, since we're talking about that neural networks, that function f is going to be a neural network. There's a small dimensionality problem over here. All of the inputs are high dimensional and very sparse. So what do I mean by this? Let's say I have a vocabulary of 100,000 words then every single word is represented as a 100,000 dimensional vector with, of, in which 99,999 nine, nine, entries are 0 and 1 entry is 1. So now you have a 100,000 dimensional space. And in this 100,000 dimensional space, we have only 100,000 vectors. So how much of the space do these 100,000 vectors actually occupy? Now let's say I add one more word to my vocabulary. Now I have 101,000 dimension, 100,001 dimensional space, which is much larger than 100,000 dimensional space. And I just added one more vector. 
to this enormous space. So things just blow up very quickly. And it's a highly inefficient use of your space. So consider this one here. First, one hot vectors, even if I decide that all of my vectors are going to be, uh, use, uh, all, all of my vectors are binary, the set of all possible vectors binary vectors in an n-dimensional space occupy the corners of an n-dimensional hypercube. Of these, my one-hot vectors use a very small subset of the corners. Now, what is the total volume occupied by all of these vectors? It's a countable set of points in a continuous space. The total volume is zero. So maybe volume is not a useful metric, right? But what about the density, what about the interpretation? So let's say I have a vector at uh, 0, 0, 0. Or one, zero, or one zero zero, right? And then I go from one zero zero to one epsilon delta, or epsilon and delta are very small numbers. This, num this vector means absolutely nothing. You have to be precisely at one zero zero, or, or that vector means absolutely nothing. It has no semantic to it. So you have this additional problem, right? And more importantly, the biggest problem is the density, right? The volume of this hypercube goes up exponentially with the, with the dimensionality of the space. So if I have an, if I'm in an n-dimensional space, the volume of the hypercube, assuming an edge of size r, which in our case is, uh, the volume of the hypercube is, goes up with r raised to n. The number of points in this volume goes up linearly. So the density is simply going to be order of n divided by r raised to n, right? The density falls off exponentially with uh, with dimensionality. Every time I add a new word to this vocabulary, I'm increasing the dimensionality of the space, the density falls, falls exponentially with, again, right? So this is a tremendously inefficient use of dimensions because within the network itself, you're not representing working with binary vectors. You're not just working on the corners of a hypercube. You're filling the volume with the weight vectors. All of your weight vectors are looking at the entire space because your weight vectors are, are real valued, which means that you have this really small density of points in that unit cube, but your weight vectors are looking over the entire cube potentially. So you can, as you can imagine, the uh, use of the space is, is really poor, really, really poor, and your ability to learn the model effectively is also going to be really, really poor. So, uh, the, the, but then, Considering that this is such a poor dimensionality, you know, use of dimensionality, why would we use one hot vectors in the first case, first place? Why couldn't we use a log n bit representation? After all, if I want to use a vocabulary of say 10, 24 words, how many bits do I need to index every one of these words? Just 10, right? So why do I need to live in a 10, 24 dimensional space? when I can represent each of these words using just 10 bits, which is an extremely efficient, far more efficient use of the space, right? Use of the volume. So can anybody take a guess as what the specific benefit of a one-hot representation might be? Anyone? Pardon me? So the diff distance between any two words when you use one hot representations is the same. You're not assigning any relative importance. You're not saying these words are closer and these words are farther because you're, you're agnostic to any semantic itself. The distance between two one hot vectors is square root of two. That's a fixed distance regardless of uh, which two words you choose. So you are not imposing any prior beliefs on the, on the relationships between the words, between the symbols. And this is a good thing because your prior beliefs might just be wrong, right? On the other hand, there are relationships of this kind. It's just that we are pretending we, we don't know them, and so we are, we are making no assumptions about them. We are pretending there's no bias. So the solution that we will often use is to project all of these points into a lower dimensional subspace of m dimensions. And as a consequence of projecting things down into some m dimensional subspace, the, the density of the points immediately sort of goes up. So if you go from an n dimension, from a 10,000 dimensional subspace to a 300 dimensional subspace, then the, the density of points in the uh, 
on the subspace has gone up by a factor of 10 raised to effectively 10,000, right? So, so uh, that's, that, that's a great improvement in the efficiency of the use of the space itself, which matters. The, uh, another thing that happens is that if we learn this properly, if we learn this projection properly, now the distances between the projected points will not be uniform. It will not be the same for any two points. And these distances may actually end up capturing semantic relationships between, between the points. So uh, uh, now how exactly can we represent a projection from an n-dimensional space to an m-dimensional space? If we use it's just a linear transform, it's a matrix multiplication. So you have this n-dimensional one-hot vector, but a, to, to shrink it down to m dimensions, you just, just have to multiply that by an m cross n matrix. And this you would do for every single word because all of the, your entire vocabulary, vocab, vocabulary is going into the same subspace, right? So that means that in our problem over here, when you're trying to predict the nth word based on the first n minus one words, you would be multiplying each of the first n minus one words with a projection matrix P, which zaps it down to m dimensions, and then subsequently use the lower dimensional representations within your function f to predict the nth word. Observe that the nth word itself doesn't have to be predicted in the projected space. You're just trying to make a prediction. So that, it's, that, that can be uh, the full n-dimensional uh, prediction. Now, when we're implementing these as neural networks, the problem becomes very simple. Multiplication with a matrix is basically a one layer network with linear activation. So this is the equivalent of saying that every one of my words is going to be passed through the same network subnet and that these outputs are then forwarded on to my function f which makes the final prediction. P is a simple linear transform so it's going to be the same transform, the same network being applied to W1 through Wn. So the entire thing is now one larger network where the, uh, where the colored portions of the network, the first layer, are a shared parameter network where the subnets applied to each word have identical parameters. And then now, now you can just use standard rules of backpropagation to learn those parameters. So uh, if you were using like a time delay neural network, which is basically saying that I'm going to be predicting the nth word based on the previous n minus one words, which is just the, uh, which is just the iterated and not the recurrent structure, then uh, at each time, you're going to, you would be passing each word through this projection matrix, and then subsequent computation is going to be performed on the projected inputs. So you see that purple P on top of every word, each input word is first projected down, and that is passed into the rest of my network, which performs subsequent computations. Now, if we're speaking of iterated structures, there are alternate formalisms. So uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the, the uh, soft bag of words, the model tries to predict a word based on words in the immediate context, both to the left and the right. The purpose here is not so much uh, to learn to predict as to learn the kind of projection which is most effective in capturing and in learning a lower dimensional representation of the word. Or you have things called skip grams, which predict both adjacent words on both sides of a word based on the word. Different variants. And things that you will actually uh, encounter in, uh, later in your projects or even in class are models like BERT and transformer nets, which do a somewhat more complicated variant of exactly the same problem to learn such, learn such representations. Now, the nice thing that happens is that uh, from, from when you learn these, uh, learn these models is that uh, it turns out that the, in the embedded space, the distances between words end up being carrying some semantic representation. So for example, these are examples from one of the early papers on this topic from, by Mikolov, and he shows the, uh, uh, a two-dimensional representation projection of, of the names of state countries and the names of their capitals. And you can see that the vector distance, the vectors which separate, say, Greece from Athens, is pretty much the same as the vector that separates Portugal from Lisbon. 
So, you, the vector relationships between words captures a semantic relationship over here, capital R. Or you would find similarly that uh, if you subtracted the projection of king from queen and then added that to man, you would end up with the projection of woman. So, you basically get this, you get other kinds of relationships. The, uh, the, uh, the relative arrangements of words actually end up capturing semantic information. So, when we were, when you are generating language, this is what our model would be. Remember, we saw this example where a, a, uh, uh, a C program was being generated. So, the model there would be something like this. The hidden units would be one or more layers of LSTMs. And as uh, at each time, you would be producing the next word. So, uh, the, uh, to train the network itself, you would be giving it sequences of inputs. The sequences of desired outputs are going to be the next word at each time. So, this is learned easily enough. And before the words are actually analyzed by the network, every single word is going to be projected down using this projection matrix. And once the network is learned, synthesis is, synthesis is somewhat straightforward. So uh, uh, if you want to use this network to generate something random which looks plausible, you would feed it the first few words as one hot vectors, which get projected down and passed on to the network. At the end of the last input word, the network generates a probability distribution over all of the words. And from this probability distribution, you can uh, draw a word, which is the next word. And then you just thus get, so given W1 through W3, the uh, network would produce a distribution over words from which you can draw a word. And that is going to be your best guess or your guess for the next word in the sequence. And now that you have the next word in the sequence, you actually have the first four words. And so you can go ahead and feed that as the next input to your network. And that word is also going to be projected down again. The inputs are always processed in the projected space, in the lower dimensional space. And that could be used to produce the next word and so on until all the way to the end. And at some point, you can keep generating this, uh, this sequence of words till some termination condition is uh, achieved. Uh, now, either you can just decide to terminate things randomly or there might be an explicit termination condition. Now, there are problems like when you're trying to generate code, for instance. There's a natural termination condition. If you have uh, opened the parenthesis, when the final, uh, if you have opened the brackets, when the final bracket is closed, your code is over, right? Or when you're trying to generate uh, language, sentences, it turns out that uh, uh, there's a very important uh, end of sentence or end of passage marker that we often employ when we are modeling language and you know the generation is done when the model explicitly, explicitly generates a symbol saying the sentence has ended. And, and, and so your uh, generation would terminate, which, give, which is what this, uh, uh, which is the technique that was actually used to, this, to produce this little code we saw a couple of classes ago. Uh, this was trained on uh, Linux source code and uh, it actually uses a character level model, which produces, predicts character sequences. And that model was used to generate, uh, generate randomly generate outputs, and actually ends up generating something that looks very much like, uh, like a program. Or here was another example that I found on the web where somebody used exactly the same technique to see if I can see if this works. Uh, somewhere. Can I turn the audio on? This is. I try it now. Is it on your laptop? Oh, yeah. That right. doesn't matter, right? Uh, so, so. Anyway, somebody actually trained this on on uh, uh, piano music and use this scores of and use this to generate piano music scores uh, I think this case in, or maybe in this, in this case I think I think it was MIDI 
and it actually produces very plausible sounding piano music. So you should visit this website and actually play it. Try these examples out. And it actually sounds like, sounds like uh, proper music, which is pretty uh, impressive. Anyway, so that was just a segue off to the side, talking about modeling language uh, and, uh, and uh, embeddings. So when we projected the words down to a lower dimensional space, the lower dimensional representation of what we will call embeddings of the words. And uh, word embeddings, generating word embeddings or uh, embeddings for entire sentences is an entire, uh, uh, at this point, an art form. And it turns out that doing this just right can be, a cre uh, can be critical for many language-based applications. Anyway, moving back to our problem, the next kind of model that we looked at was something like this guy, right? Where you analyzed an entire sequence of inputs and produced a single output. So uh, instances where question answering, you see an entire sequence of words. You can't really answer the question till you've seen the last word. So when somebody says color of sky, the, suppose the answer that you want to return is blue. Now until you see the last word, you don't know whether he's saying color of sky or color of banana. So you can't answer. The fact that the words color of have turned up primes you about how to answer it but the answer really cannot be known until the entire sequence is seen. Or you could be uh, recognizing speech, where you have a sequence of log spectral or capstral vectors, and the output is the phoneme ID at the end of the sequence, which may be represented as an n-dimensional output probability vector, which n is the number, where n is the number of phonemes. So again, you'd be seeing the entire sequence of input and producing a single probability vector. So if you are performing inference, and here's where things begin to get interesting. The, when would you actually decide what the input was or what the correct response is? You would have to wait all the way to the end before deciding what the correct response was. So you'd have to see the entire question and then produce an answer. Or you would have to see the entire uh, entire sequence of spectral vectors and then produce a classification output. But what about the actual computation? When you're performing a computation with a model of this kind, as the, as the input comes in, the length of the input is arbitrary, right? If the length of the input were fixed, this is just a standard MLP problem. So you don't really have to, you don't need a recurrent network for this, uh, for, to analyze those. Now, so the fact is that the length of the input itself is indeterminate. So when is the output actually being produced? How, is, are we actually waiting till the last input to produce an output? Or are we producing outputs at every time and just ignoring all the early outputs? What actually happens? Anybody? I suppose everybody's as asleep as I am. But anyway, the computation is exactly the same, regardless of how, how, of how we do it, right? So what actually happens is something like this. You are actually producing outputs at every single time. We only read it at the end of the sequence. That's because you have no way of predicting. The inputs, we're not actually restricting the uh, size of the input to be a fixed size. So you analyze the entire input sequence, and at each time, the network is actually producing an output. But then when you determine that the input has terminated, that's when you're actually reading the output. So when you train the network, how do you train it? How do you back propagate? Once again, you wait all the way to the end of the input, then you get an output at the end, and you had to get a desired output at the end, you can compute a divergence between these two. This divergence, the derivatives of this divergence can be propagated backwards to every single time, and, uh, and you can compute the uh, responsibility of every single input, uh, the contribution of every single input of the divergence, and aggregate these to learn all of your network parameters. 
But then this is, what is this doing? This is kind of assuming that all of these outputs are irrelevant, right? Does that make sense? So let's say I'm performing a speech recognition and somebody says, says the sound ah. Uh, then does it make sense for me to only consider the error at the final instant? Especially considering that the network has been producing outputs at every time. So what would be a more reasonable thing to be doing? Consider this, if I just stop my R halfway in the middle, would the sound be different? It's still the same sound, right? If I was saying E, if I stopped this halfway, would the, would the sound be different? It's still the same sound. So waiting till the end to decide what this should have been and to compute the error and back propagate it is throwing away a lot of cues. So I'm uh, pretending that there's no useful information at these intermediate stages is throwing away a lot of cues. A more reasonable thing would be in, these, in this case would be to say that even in the intermediate stages, the answer is kind of evident, right? So instead of just saying that I'm only going to produce an output at the very end and consider the divergence only at the very end, you can say that there is actually an output being produced at every time. Now, which is true, there is an output produced at every time. The reason you're not considering the divergences over the entire sequences is that you don't really, you're assuming that you don't have a label at the intermediate times, that you have a label only when the input has been terminated. But, but the fact of the matter is that in these cases, you can assume the same label that you got at the termination of the input at every time. So which would mean that it's perfectly acceptable to say that the target label at each time is exactly as the, as the label that I would have got, that, 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 I, that I would like to get at the final time. And so now, in this case now, you can actually go ahead and define the divergence everywhere and define the divergence as a weighted combination of the uh, cross entropy between the actual, the divergence between the actual output of the network and the desired output of the network. Now, uh, so this kind of uh, behavior, this kind of model is kind is uh, uh, makes sense pretty much everywhere. If you just factor in, if you if you just uh, factor in the relevance of the individual components of the uh, the in the outer, the uh, contributions of the individual time instance somehow into the weights. So if you were doing something something like speech recognition. Then if I'm saying the phoneme ah, it's kind of perfectly acceptable to assume that the output at each time must be ah. So my weights would typically be one at each time. On the other hand, if I were doing something like question answering, although I can, I can claim that the target output must be blue at every time, that's really not a very reasonable thing to be saying when all I've said so far is color off. So, in this case, you can still think of this as a weighted sum of divergences, except that the weight is one for the final time and zero at other times. But uh, the uh, thinking of the divergence between the, the target and the actual output of the network as a weighted sum of the divergences at each times makes perfect sense, right? So uh, using that framework, you can actually train the network uh, I train all of the network parameters given collections of uh, input output pairs and use this for inference. Now this sort of network itself is so we can sort of assume is fairly simple. So the, so the, uh, this sort of network, the network on the left, we can assume is fairly simple. The only little quirk that we had to factor in was the fact that we were ignoring the outputs at other times at, at times other than at the end, and we could actually explicitly assign labels to those to improve our training process procedure, right? Now, the more important variant of it is the one to the right, where the output is order synchronous and time synchronous, basically. 
So where you have a sequence of inputs and you have a sequence of outputs and the order of the inputs affects the order of the outputs, but you really do, but there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the inputs and the outputs. So uh, because the exact location of the outputs is kind of unknown a priori. So this is actually just a, an extension of the problem to the left. So this guy here is just an extension of the problem to this left, to the left. How so? That is because if I'm trying to, you know, do something like this, speech has come in and there were three phonemes and the three phonemes were b uh, and t because the person said but. Now, here uh, we want to asynchronously output a sequence of, a sequence of symbols. You have a sequence of inputs that came in and after seeing a certain number of those inputs, you want to produce the symbol b. Then after seeing a some more, you want to produce a symbol a. Uh, and then after seeing still some more, you want to produce, produce a symbol t. So this you can think of if I told you exactly where each of these outputs must be produced, then this, just, this is just a concatenation of three, three instances of the prior model. So it's very simple, right? Except that the concatenation really complicates matters when I don't tell you. If I actually segmented things down, if I told you where the outputs must be produced, that does not complicate matters very much beyond what we saw for the previous model. But when I don't tell you where the outputs must be produced, then what really happens is that the network actually produces outputs at every time, right? And we have to figure out when to read the outputs. And that output is not given to you. So the network is producing this entire sequence of outputs, one at every time. Which of these are the real outputs we must read? And which are the ones we must ignore? that information is not present, right? So if you actually, actually look at the, the actual output of the network, the actual output of the network is going to look like this. At each time, as the input comes in, it's going to produce a probability distribution over all of the symbols. So the output of the network is, the, is in fact this entire matrix where every column is a probability distribution over all of the symbols. And from this, you're neither given information about how many symbols to read and where to read the symbols. So how do we decide which of these outputs are these bogus columns where there really is no output and which of these are the columns where there is a real output that must be read? This inference must be made. Now, there's a trivial solution to this. The trivial solution is that we can just go ahead and pick the most, most probable output at every time. Now, picking the most probable output at every time is going to assume that there is a valid output at every time, which we, know, which we know not to be true. So now, we can apply a heuristic. You say that if two consecutive outputs are the same, I'm going to assume that the first one was just, in the, is first to, just a repetition of the actual output that must be produced. And so you can just merge them and say the real symbol occurs at the end of the sequence. So here, you'd have something like G, F, E, D, right? There's a problem here. And what would that problem be? You cannot really distinguish between this guy where you really want to produce the symbol F twice and this one where you only want to produce it once because in both cases, you're just going to be output picking the, producing one long sequence of F as being the most likely symbol, right? So there is no way of distinguishing between repetitions of a symbol and a single instance of a symbol. And then there's also this additional factor, the resulting sequence may be completely meaningless. I mean, what is feed? I have no idea and I don't suppose anybody really does, right? So uh, now uh, this simple heuristic clearly is not doing the job for us, right? You need, we, we need to do something more. Now, you, you could sort of try to clean this up 
let us at least clean up the second, the second issue, which is that the actual sequences you get may be completely meaningless in the process. You could end up maybe also influencing the first problem, that of finding distinguishing between repetitions and single instances by imposing external constraints on what sequences are actually allowed. So for instance, when, um, when we are looking at sequences of uh, uh, what, what sequences of output, pro, uh, output symbols uh, we, will, we will actually read from this table of probabilities, then we could impose a constraint that the sequence of symbols after collapsing must represent valid words in the dictionary. So this sort of eliminates the, partially eliminates the issue that the, the output you get might be, might be meaningless. It does not actually eliminate the issue that you cannot distinguish between repetitions. For instance, if you have two words uh, which are exactly the same that, except that one of them has got a repetition of a character. So that is say one of them is fed and the other is feed. Even though you know, bo both of them are in the dictionary and this procedure is not going to be able to actually allow you to distinguish between fed and feed because one has one E and the other has two E's if the outputs were characters. Uh, you're assuming that the network is also going to learn the dictionary and the language ex exactly, and that won't not, that won't necessarily happen, right? So these are just, in principle, yes. In practice, no. Right? So these are extra, and and again, uh, so imposing a constraint of this kind partially eliminates that problem. And the uh, the uh, but again, the problem is not so much with the how you have trained the network, but how you are reading entries off, right? And as we will see in the next class, the fact that you have trained the network to, uh, with lots of valid words does not necessarily mean that this table of probabilities is actually going to give you uh, only valid, if you just, you know, the sequence, sequence of most probable symbols are only going to represent valid words. That will not naturally fall out. We'll see that why. We'll see why later, right? And you still don't get rid of the issue that uh, repetitions cannot be distinguished. It's a good question. We'll see the answer to that why. Anyway, uh, so going back, we've sort of seen what we've seen so far is a part. We partially address the problem of how do we read the sequence of outputs from the output of the network when, uh, you know, when it is actually in fact producing outputs at each time and, and only some of them represent valid outputs. Now we have not actually fully addressed it. I just sort of gave you a flavor of what kind of solution might be required. We will get back to this later. But for now, look at the second problem which tends to be equally problematic. How do you train the model? Now, say, you somebody actually gave you this data where you have a sequence of inputs and you gave you the sequence order synchronous outputs and told you exactly where each output symbol occurred. In that case, the problem is simple enough. You just, since you know exactly where the output, sim, uh, output symbols occurred, I can compute the divergences at those times. The total divergence is going to be this, could be, could uh, a simple, uh, uh, characterization of the total divergence could be the sum of the divergences at these individual times, which I could back propagate. Then uh, we can sort of go one step ahead and use the trick that we used earlier where instead of, just, instead of letting the empty spaces remain blank, we can assume that things are being repeated and now you can train your network like so, right? And now you have a little more useful, you are extracting more useful information from the output of the network and using that to train the network. But then, so uh, here you would be repeating the symbols over their duration and using the, uh, uh, du using the uh, 
total divergence over the entire sequence with the repetitions to train the network, which is going to be the sum over all input times of the cross entropy between the output of the network and the target output of the network, where this target output now is no longer what was actually provided. Some of these guys are synthetic in that you created them by replicating your input, uh, replicating target symbols, right? And each of these cross entropy terms is simply going to be, as we saw, the log of the probability assigned to the target symbol at time t by the network. So observe that this cross and this divergence function simply ends up being the sum, the, you can think of it almost as the uh, negative log likelihood of the sequence of output symbols or sequence of target symbols as computed by the network. And this is what we're going to minimize. Or alternately st stated, we are going to be maximizing the log likelihood assigned to the, to the correct sequence by the network. Now this is still great if somebody told you exactly where the symbols kicked in, because now you know what the sequence is, right? But what if the timing information were not given? Only the sequence of output symbols. So now you're given the sequence of inputs, and you said, here's this recording. This recording represents the, sound, re represents the word bad. So you know you have the sequence of vectors, and then you know that there are, when this sequence of vectors is fed to the network, the network, the, in, the inference pr uh, performed by the network must produce the symbols b, a, and d. That is the only information given to you. You're not told where the b must be, be output, where the A must be output, and where the DER must be output. So in this case, how do we even begin go about going, around comp going about computing the divergence? Because we don't know where the, what the symbols are at each time. You don't know where the BER ended. You don't know where the A ended. So you don't know which portions of the, which subsets of the output uh, uh, outputs must must be bad, eh, right? Or which ones must be duh, which ones must be, but that information is missing. So at this point, there's uncertainty about how to even compute the divergence. Leave alone how you compute the, de the derivative of the divergence with respect to the individual outputs. And so this becomes a problem, right? And so th this is where I will leave off. And so in the next class, we are actually going to see how we will address this problem, how we are going to be training without aligned truth, which is the so-called connectionist temporal classification network, where we'll speak about, uh, uh, about dealing with lack of alignment, and also in the process, how do you address the issue of repeating simple symbols? and the so-called CTC, connectionist temporal classification decoder. Right. Questions?